Good evening, church, and welcome to evening worship together. It's good to be in the house of God again this evening. We're a bit light on here this evening. There's a few sick and uh, many who are away, uh, but we'll have a wonderful time of worship anyway. I just want to open up the scriptures to 1 Chronicles chapter 17 and verse 20. I'm just going to read one verse from there. Chronicles chapter 17 and verse 20 says this, O Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Now, I'm so thankful tonight that God is not like us, and I'm so thankful that we are not like God. We are very frail, we are very fickle, we're very up and down, but God is faithful. He is enduring and he's altogether unlike us. Uh, God is holy, and holy means completely separate, separate from us. So the first hymn we're going to be singing tonight is Holy, 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 and we're going to celebrate our holy God together tonight. Please be standing to sing Holy, 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 hymn 70. One man who walked this earth who wasn't just like God but he was God himself and that is why we bow down to him that is why we worship him it is Jesus Christ and he has a name that is above all names and that's what we're going to sing tonight we're going to sing song number 43 Jesus name above all names thank you
Uh, there's no new announcements tonight. It's what I uh, spoke about this morning. But the most, um, the most upcoming announcement, I suppose, is this Friday night we have our sports evening. Uh, we're meeting at the Aquatic Centre in Katoomba. Uh, it'll be 5 p.m. And, uh, yeah, that's the, the basketball courts. As soon as you go into the Aquatic Centre, you turn right and you'll meet us there at the basketball course. There's a couple of other um, fellowships coming up. We have a men's fellowship at uh, Mike's house on the 10th of May, and uh, we've been meeting at his house. Uh, I, think, I think that's at 5 p.m. as well. So I'll be praying and thinking about that, thinking about people we can invite to that. I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Jan up to do our Bible reading and family prayer. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Central Mountains Baptist Church tonight for our evening worship service. Our scripture reading is in John chapter 12, 27 to 50. John 12, 27 to 50. God's word says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for the purpose I came to this hour, Father, glorify your name. Then the voice came from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me but for your sake. Now is the judgment of, the, of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. The people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness." And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. May God bless the reading of his word and the study of this as Wayne comes up later on to preach from this passage. But let's pray together, dearly beloved. As a family, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for your holiness and your majesty. We stand in awe of Lord, who you are and what you can do and the power that you possess, the authority that you have over everything. Thank you, Lord, that in everything that you are, we have been so blessed, privileged, and we feel so unworthy, O oh Lord, of your love. 
you commended, you, you, you showed your love, you demonstrated your love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, thank you so much for meeting us where we needed you the most. We were in the miry pit of, of, of the sinfulness. We were without hope. We were on our way to eternal judgment. We have nothing in our hands to bring before you that would make you accept us. It's not about what we have or what we have done. It's about your mercy that saved us, O oh Lord. So thank you so much, Lord, because even be this very privilege of prayer is a blessing spurting out from that relationship we have now with you. You are our Father. We are your children because we have trusted in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, Lord, we would like to pray and give these burdens to you. Lay them at your feet because, Lord, you have commanded us to pray. You have encouraged us to pray. And for us Christians, not praying is like not breathing. This is our lifeline, O oh Lord. And we thank you that at the end of this lifeline, our dear Heavenly Father is listening. Lord, we pray on behalf of our brothers and sisters tonight who are going through different physical ailments, diseases, challenges. We pray, Lord, for Sue Mayo as she faces uh, another surgery coming. I ask that you give wisdom to the doctors. I ask that you prepare her body for that. And I pray that that surgery will be successful, dear Lord. I pray that you give her health, good health. Also pray, Lord, for John and Monique Morgans. I've suffered for a long time. And there are a lot of physical challenges, even on a daily basis. But Father, I ask that you sustain them through all of the difficulties. I pray you keep them looking unto Jesus, O oh Lord, and remind them that even though our outer man perishes, our inner man is being renewed day by day. I pray for your strength and comfort as well for Auntie Alma, for Jeanette. Oh, I ask the Lord for your strength upon them. I know their desire is to join us every time we gather here in worship. I pray you grant that desire. It's so lovely to have seen Auntie Alma this morning join us. I pray this will be a beginning of a smooth sailing um, coming weeks and months and years. I also would like to pray, Lord, for baby Jonah. I pray that whatever lack of nutrients that he may have, that you will supply and that you will give him better days and weeks and years ahead. I pray for strength for his loving parents, Carlo and Sonia, that they may be able to know exactly what to do, how to assist him, and to show love to him and to the rest of their boys. We also would like to commit to you, dear Lord, Phil, I pray that in this challenge of having cancer, the Lord, you will use these times of, of suffering to look to the one who can truly help, and that is you. Now, I'm just not praying for healing for him, but his need of salvation. I pray that you impart to him grace. May he come to trust Christ as Savior. I also would like to commit to you Nathaniel and even Stephen in that family, O oh Lord, together with Gladys, they have seen uh, very difficult days pertaining to their health. But I pray you sustain them, dear Lord. 
I pray that you show them that you are God who heals. Pray also for Janina. Um, there are some tough um, challenges as well towards her health. I pray also, Lord, for your healing for her. I pray for those who are pregnant as well, for Sue and Miriam. I pray that you continue to bless the pregnancies, that the babies inside their womb will continue to grow and uh, will be delivered in your own time. I pray that the moms will also be healthy, Sue and Miriam. And uh, whatever challenges of the pregnancy they may face, I pray that you strengthen them. And Lord, I pray you comfort them and give them joy even in the midst of sometimes the morning sickness and just the, the, um, the aches um, in their body due to the pregnancy. But oh Lord, we are deeply reminded this evening that children are a heritage from the Lord. And so we thank you for blessing uh, both families with this little one. I also would like to commit to you, dear Lord, um, the rest of our brothers and sisters who may have physical difficulties. Um, I ask, Lord, that at this very moment, you would visit them and remind them of your presence in their lives. And in the midst, Lord, of the pains I pray that their eyes will be focused on the land that is brighter than day. Because in that land that you're preparing for us, dear Jesus, there is no more pain, nor sickness, nor death. There is only eternal joy, peace, and rest. Remind us that this is not our home. Lord, thank you for giving Jono and um, Josh the privilege to minister this morning at Westlake's Baptist Church. I pray that the word preached by Josh and the testimony given by Jono will be an encouragement to our brothers and sisters there. I pray that you continue to use Eshwan and Angie as they both minister to your people. I pray for wisdom as um, Eshwan continues to preach and teach I pray that together with the rest of the church leaders, they will lead the church in the path that you would have them take. A path of service, a path of following you, a path of reaching the lost, and a path, Lord, wherein your church will continue to stand for the truth of the word of God. Lord, I pray for your blessing towards the different parts of our worship tonight, especially in the preaching of your word. Please, Father, bless your servant. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Jan. And before we come to the Word of God tonight, we're going to sing one last final hymn. That's Take My Life and Let It Be. So can I invite you to stand up as we sing this last hymn before the preaching of the Word.
hearts for the word of God. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, Carlo. And what a privilege it is to be able to come and worship freely. Do you remember during COVID? Do you remember those times when we couldn't come and worship? Uh, do you remember uh, the, those that are persecuted uh, throughout the world and they're not able to come and worship like we are? It's a privilege to be able to sing songs. It's a privilege to be able to pray. And it's a privilege to be able to hear the word of God freely. Please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 12 and verse uh, 27. We'll be actually starting from verse 28, but we need verse 27 to put it in context, context to, tonight. Uh, if you'd also have your blue hand out ready, there's verses outside of John that we'll be using as we move through the message this evening. We have been doing a message called Jesus' Words going through the Gospels, and we've been looking at the four Gospels and how they, um, how they mesh with each other, and there's a perfect meshing of those four Gospels. And right now we're on the day before Jesus' death, Thursday, crucifixion eve, and it's the morning of that day. The title of this evening's message is, Jesus Tests the Heart. Let's ask God's help. Dear Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we come to your word tonight, that you would open it out to us. Indeed, your word is living and powerful sharper than any two-edged sword, pissing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so we pray, Lord, that your word would pierce our hearts this evening and that you would speak to us as only your spirit can in a personal way. Probably everyone will get something different from this message tonight. May your spirit apply it to our hearts and we pray it for Jesus' glory. Amen. On your sheets is Luke 11 and verse 23. It says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. He who is not with me is against me. That means, dear, dear friend, dear brother and sister, you cannot sit on the fence. One blog comments, There is no competition. No person who ever walked the earth is as loved as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the hero of the greatest book ever written. He is the subject of many books. He is the subject of many songs sung about him. More buildings have been built in his honour. More meetings have been made in his honour than any other person on earth. For 2,000 years, his followers all over the world have worshipped him, his life, his death and his resurrection. No celebrity, no sports team, artist had the following has the following, or will have the following, that Jesus has. Yes, he is beloved. However, we often gloss over the fact that at his birth, even at his birth, Jesus was hunted. Herod wanted him dead. During his life, there were six credible attempts on his life. And then, even though he was perfectly innocent, they crucified him. Even though the Lord Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth, they crucified him anyway. You see... Some loved him, some hated him, and Jesus therefore becomes the test of our human hearts. In the first two centuries after Christ, Christians faced persecution, torture, and death. Jesus, since Jesus walked the earth, more than 70 million Christians have given their lives for him. And in the last century, the 20th century, over half of that 70 million. We're not getting better we are getting worse. It is also estimated that two million Christians were killed between 2000 and 2020. In 2020, in Nigeria alone, uh, 2,200 Christians were killed. Being hated was not only something that Jesus took on himself, it was, un it was something that he also understood that his followers would carry in their lives too. Some loved him, some hated him, and Jesus is the test of human hearts still today. And therefore, Jesus is the great divider. For most of our country's history, Christians have enjoyed a level of comfort. Christian morals have been agreed upon and have been uh, part of our, our laws of the land, our guiding laws. However, those days are behind us. Living in a post-Christian culture, 
the divide between Christians on the one hand and the world on the other hand is only going to get greater. It's only going to be starker. The one is going to be darker and the other is going to be lighter in comparison. Our allegiances cannot be hidden. Some love him. Some hate him. You choose. Even if you have never considered to follow Jesus, it has become apparent that playing both sides is no longer an option. Our headlines are full of, full of outrageous laws. Uh, there are silly school curriculums, hatred and violence, which we saw even yesterday on our screens, evil personified. There is no middle ground and it's only going to get worse. Dear friend, where will you stand? Luke 11 and verse 23 says, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You cannot sit on the fence. Dear friends, we must decide where are we going to stand. Now, the disciples didn't realize it, but they were on the eve of the cruci crucifixion. Jesus knew it, of course, but they didn't know it. This was the last day he would have his freedom. This for some would be the last day, therefore, they ha would have the opportunity to see Jesus, to hear Jesus, and to respond uh, to Jesus as far as his life on earth was concerned, to love him or to hate him. Some had decided already they had rejected Jesus and Jesus had spoken to those rejectors on the Tuesday of the week he died. And on that Tuesday, he gave woe after woe after woe and then he ended with these words in Matthew 23 and verse 38. See, your house is left to you desolate. And indeed, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Others had decided too. They had decided to follow him no matter what. And decades later, many of them did give their lives for the Lord Jesus. But others were trying to sit on the fence, vacillating, procrastinating, undecided. Such are not with Jesus. Such who are not with Jesus are against him. He had last words for them too that Thursday morning. And they're the words that we look at in this section that Jan read a little bit earlier. John gives us this record in John 12 and 28 to 50. And in this section, it leads us to make four comments about Jesus. The theme that you'll see through this is that you cannot sit on the fence. The first comment to make about Jesus from John 12, 28 to 50 is Jesus glorified the Father. Jesus glorified the Father. Now in, this last mess, in our last message, we, we uh, looked at great sacrifice and great glory. So we had much to say about glorifying the Father, but allow me to make some further brief comments this evening. As we have noted already, Jesus only had words of judgment for those who had rejected him. He had finished with them two days before. Nevertheless, there was a crowd. We don't know how big the crowd was. It would have included his immediate disciples and included some Greeks that were trying to make inquiry about Jesus, indicating that the gospel would, would indeed go to the whole world, and included some others, these others that were undecided. They were kind of interested. They were kind of searching, but they hadn't made any commitment to Jesus. Now Jesus prays, thinking of what is ahead, and all through this passage, Jesus is thinking of the cross. It's the next day. His whole, his whole mission on earth was to come to give his life a ransom for many. But especially this day, he's thinking of the cross. And so we read in verse 28, him praying, Father, glorify your name. And the answer was absolutely immediate. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. These vacillating followers of Jesus knew that the voice was supernatural, but they didn't understand it. Was it an angel? Was it something else? Uh, because as yet, they were on the other side of the fence. We read in verse 29, therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. So they don't understand. And Jesus explains to them in the next verse, 
he explains the voice to them. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. It was so they would know who he was. This was the third time that the Father had spoken audibly of the Son. The first was Jesus' baptism. We read about that in Matthew 3 and verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The second was the transfiguration when Peter, James and John were taken up onto the mountain and saw Jesus transfigured before them. And we read in Luke 9.35, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And now again in verse 28, we hear the father speaking from heaven, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The father was authenticating that indeed he was pleased with his son and that what he would do the next day was to the glory of the Father, uh, Jesus going to the cross. The Father gave them no room for doubt. The Father glorified the Son, and the Son would glorify the Father. So the question I have for you tonight is, do we? Do we glorify the Father? Do we glorify the Son? Well, let's see. Remember how as a little kid, you often tried to get the biggest piece of pie <laughs> or the last lolly for yourself. Sad to say, we never seem to outgrow that tendency of self. That self-life is embedded in the flesh, uh, which is part of every human being on earth. Even our best efforts, our, or even, even in our best efforts, our motives often seem mixed. You've heard of the person who subtly, of course, says how they, they spend two hours in prayer every morning and give 20% of their income uh, to, to the Lord. Or maybe you've felt a surge of smugness as you've thought about your faithfulness in church while others have forgotten their priorities. Who are we thinking about in such things? Are we seeking to impress? You see, sometimes we do the right things for the wrong motive. How dare we seek to bring glory to ourselves and divert glory from the Lord? I've caught myself doing that and then confession and forsaking that pride is the only way to go, isn't it? The Christian life requires humble dependence. We can't live it without his spirit. So when we get it right, the correct testimony is, if it's good, it's the Lord, the rest is us. Yes, and that's true even with the things we find easy to do. The Lord enables it to get it done, the right thing for the right motive. We cannot do it without his enabling. Whether we're thinking about prayer, witnessing, coming to church, our very thoughts, love, joy, and peace that are meant to fill our lives, all of these are from the Lord. So we need to give him the glory when we get these things right, don't we? If the Father gave the glory to the Son and the Son gave glory to the Father, we have the best of examples, don't we? We dare not take the glory to ourselves. The second comment to make about Jesus from John 12, 28 to 50 is, Jesus defeated Satan and the world system. He defeated Satan and the world system. Now, Jesus, as we've just seen, glorified the Father through the cross. And secondly, Jesus defeated Satan and the world through the cross. Jesus, as you'll see right through this section, is focused on the cross. Jesus said in verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. So there are two death blows right there. <laughs> there's death to the world and there's death to Satan. And we could say, praise God for that. The world is judged and Satan is cast out. We give glory to him. But don't we have the world and Satan still with us? Regarding the world and its judgment, now this is future. Jesus is saying now, even as he goes to the cross, it's going to be done now. But we read in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. 
He has appointed a day. He, God the Father, has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, the man he has chosen. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So we know who that man is, don't we? It is the Lord Jesus. And this is future. Jesus is going to judge the world in the future. So how does he say the judgment of the world is now? Well, it was his death It was the death and resurrection of Jesus that guarantees the judgment of the world in the future. By his death and resurrection, that was the next day he was accomplishing what would be in the future. It was was absolutely certain. Our Lord Jesus will be the judge. And because the world is going to be judged, the scripture gives us this advice in 1 John 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world all the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Of course, when the world is defeated, Satan has nothing left to rule. He will be defeated also. He is cast out, uh, Jesus says in these verses. Since the world is finishing, he will have nothing left to rule. But let me give you just a very brief future history of Satan's downward fall. During the tribulation, Satan is permanently cast out of heaven. Right now, according to the book of Job, he can go before God and accuse us. He is the accuser of the brethren, but not during the tribulation. We read in Revelation 12 and verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. He has no further entry into heaven. At the end of the tribulation, Satan is cast into the bottomless pit. Revelation 20 and verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. And then finally, at the end of the millennium of Christ's rule on earth, finally at the end of that time, Satan is released for a time, but his end is not there. Revelation 20 and verse 10 says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan thought he got rid of the Messiah at the cross but it was actually his own defeat. It was the greatest sting. So how do we understand the world and Satan being defeated and yet they're so active in our lives? Martin Luther wrote in the 1500s, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. We can have the victory through the truth of the word of God and the foundation is the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was there that the world and Satan were judged. We stand on victory ground, brother and sister. We don't have to fight upward. We stand on the top, on the top of the mountain as it were and the foes come against us. His truth will triumph through us. Um, Luther continued, His, uh, the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure, one little word shall fell him. And it's one little word from the word of God, uh, as Jan has been teaching us as we follow the temptations of Christ uh, in the wilderness. One little word shall fell him. And Jesus' final word uh, will, will set him into the lake of fire forever. Yes, he goes about as a roaring lion, uh, the book of Peter tells us. But... The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, shall defeat him. Christ has guaranteed our victory by the cross. John Bunyan, um, in the next century, in the 1600s, um, in his allegory called Pilgrim's Progress, also wrote, 
about um, Satan and his warfare with us. He said, Christian, Christian, nimbly stretching out his hand for his sword, saying, Rejoice not against me, O enemy. When I die, I shall rise again. That's from Micah 7, 8. And with that, he gave him a deadly thrust, which made him draw back. Christian, perceiving that, thrust the sword again at him, saying, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon wings and sped away, so that for a season, Christian saw him no more. So by knowing God, loving him, uh, knowing the word of God, by looking to the Lord in faith, uh, and by the spirit of God, we are able always to have the victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil that fight against us in our lives. Yes, they are defeated. They cannot touch us when we're in him and gladly walk his way. Our dear brother David Drozd told Carlo, gave Carlo this advice, walk this way and you will be safe. That's good advice. The third comment to make about Jesus from John 12, 28 to 50 is, Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us. And again, Jesus is talking about the cross. Of course, we're going to say much more about the cross. <coughs> Christian churches can't help but talk about the cross week after week, really. It's necessary in our, our lives every day. We'll say much more about the cross. Uh, but let, let us glean from Jesus' words here. Verse 32. And if I am lifted up, and if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. He signified that he would be lifted up on a cross and also he signified what that would accomplish. At the end of verse 32, he says, will draw all peoples to myself. You might notice in your Bible that the word peoples is, is in italics, which means that it was added by the, by the translators to give further understanding. So the verse would actually read, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. The all spoken of there is the world, as in John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves the peoples of the world. And 1 John 2.2 2 says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Are you familiar with that word propitiation? It means the satisfaction of God's wrath. God is rightly angry, angry against our sin because it is damaging, it hurts us. And all the wrath that God has against sin, he poured out on Jesus. And we will not bear that wrath if we have trusted Jesus Christ as our saviour from sin. So uh, 1 John 2.2 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the whole world. It's whosoever will may come. If you haven't made that decision to come to Christ, it's whosoever will may come. It is open to you. Jesus knew how he would die and he knew what would be accomplished. Defeat of Satan in the world, of course, means salvation to us. And what a wonderful salvation it is. We could read many verses, but Romans 5.18 says, therefore, as through one man's offence, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift, free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Through Adam's sin, we're all condemned, but through Jesus' death on the cross, his free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. If you trust Christ as your saviour from sin, it is counted as though you have never sinned. What love to die for us. The miracles that Satan suggested to Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus did not do. The signs that the Pharisees demanded of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus did not do. The proofs that you might ask of him, Jesus probably will not do. You see, no pyrotechnic display of proofs or miracles could achieve what God wanted to achieve. And what did God want to achieve? He wanted to achieve that we would love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
Only love could summon a response of love. And so we read in verse 32, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. And that echoes a beautiful Old Testament verse, Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, which says, the Lord has appeared of old, the, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. With loving kindness, he draws us. And it was his love on the cross that surely draws us to himself that we might have the forgiveness of sins. The Lord of glory loves you so much that he went to the cross. Someone said, how much? And the answer is this much. And now he draws you with the cords of love. How will you respond to his love? Your response to his love shows your heart. Jesus tests the heart. You cannot sit on the fence. Now, I ask this question, what will you do with Jesus? Because, um, because it was a group that day, a hesitating, vacillating, fence-sitting, procrastinating, undecided group that Jesus was speaking to. And so that question had to come, what will you do with Jesus? Are you ready to follow him with all your heart? Are you ready to take a stand for him? Are you ready to trust him as your saviour? Some of you have. Some of you might be saying yes right now. Some of you might still be undecided. If you're undecided, there's more. The fourth comment to make about Jesus from John 12, 28 to 50 is Jesus tests the heart of people. Jesus tests the heart of people. As Jesus tests the heart, he divides people into two groups. These two groups are stated in many places. The wheat and the tares, the good and bad fish, but the most, the, the clearest example is in Luke 11 and verse 23, the verse we started with tonight. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. You're either for or against Jesus in the end. Those deliberately against Jesus, um, Jesus has already rebuked. Those following him, no matter what, were still with him at this point, his disciples. But that Thursday morning, Jesus had to speak to this group that were neither here nor there. Because they were not actively following, they were not actively following, they were in danger of being found against Jesus. So Jesus sought to move them from the undecided group to the completely committed group. He's spoken of the cross which will glorify the Father, defeat Satan and the world system, and show his love for you, in that he gave his life for you. Those sitting on the fence have a question. Uh, in verse 34, in John chapter 12, and verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. You know, that... That was something they'd read in the Old Testament. Messiah is eternal. How can you say then the Son of Man must be lifted up? And I think they had some idea what he meant by that, that he was going to die. How can Messiah live forever and you're going to die? Who is this Son of Man? Mm. Now, the answer to that question is staring them in the face. But this vacillating crowd have not yet been illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God. So Jesus gives them an invitation and then he gives them a warning against apathy. First, let's look at Jesus' words of invitation, verse 35. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. In this invitation, Jesus gives two pieces of advice. Firstly, walk in the light, verse 35. A little, while, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light. And the second piece of advice is believe in the light, verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light. But the one has to come before the other. You have to believe in the light so that you can walk in the light. 
If a man, woman, boy or girl believes in the light, they become a son or daughter of light. Verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Then they will be able to see to walk in the light clearly. Tomorrow, crucifixion day, the light would no longer be with them. And therefore, he says in verse 35, a little while longer, the light is with you. It would be just, just over 24 hours till Jesus' death. A little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. They had to take the opportunity, therefore, while it is open to them. May I ask this evening, will you? John then tells us that after Jesus talked to these vacillating people, he left. The end of verse 36 says, these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. Uh, but John records more words. Jesus did speak to them and then he did leave, but John records more words that Jesus said uh, before he left. And we're going to pick it up at verse 44. Verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but him who sent me. To believe in the Son is to believe in the Father. He stops talking about the light and he starts talking a bit more clearly here. To believe in the Son is to believe in the Father. Verse 45, he who sees me sees him who sent me. So if you see the Son, you see the Father, of course. Other verses similarly say, John 1 and verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of Christ was the glory of the Father. John 14 and verse 7, which he said later that day, the evening of the Thursday, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. If you see Jesus, you see the Father. If you hear Jesus, you hear the Father. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. Those that say Jesus was a mere man have not understood these verses and the light is not in them. Examples of these, the cults, Mormons, and JWs, Jesus was a mere man. No, he was fully God of fully God. Verse 46 says, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Jesus is not just a light, but he is the light. In other passages he said, I am the light of the world. That's who the son of man is and you're invited to believe in him. You're invited by Jesus to believe in the light so that you might have the light of life fill your life. That's the invitation. Secondly, let's look at Jesus' words of warning uh, to those who are sitting on the fence. Verse 47. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, notice it is not a rejection necessarily, but they just haven't actively believed. If anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. What Jesus is meaning there is, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, believe them, I do not judge him now, for I did not come this time to judge the world, but to save the world. Of course, Jesus will be the judge on that final day. We've already read uh, some of that from John 17. But let's go back to John 17 and start in verse 30 this time. Truly, these times of ignorance, men not knowing about God, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Therefore, he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he who has ordained is given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus will be the judge and the criteria that Jesus will use in that last day is the words that he has spoken. Verse 48, and he who rejects me, what does that mean? And does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word which I have spoken will judge him in that day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that 
what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. So the Son's words are the Father's words. And in summary, Jesus is saying, you have heard the truth, but to this point anyway, you have not responded to it. In summary, Jesus is saying, if you reject me now, I will reject you then. Or even if you ignore me now, I will reject you then. You did not respond to the truth. And these words, Jesus himself is testing the heart of every man, woman, boy and girl. Warren Wiersbe says, when a person starts to ignore the light, something begins to change within him. And he comes to a place where he cannot believe. This is the judicial blindness that God permits to come over the eyes of people who do not take the truth seriously. So the same judgment comes upon those who reject Christ and those who appear that they might trust Christ, but they actually don't. They fail to confess him openly. In the judgment, they will face every bit of scripture they've heard. The very word ignored, the very word rejected, becomes the judge. If this is so, why, why would people ignore or reject Christ? Why, why is that? For so many, it's the fear of what people will think. Jesus says in John 10 and verse 28, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear man. He can kill you. But fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Do not fear man, but fear God. Fear him in such a way that you will not let yourself ignore what he says. Jesus' words are God's words, and so verses 48 to 50 are authoritative words uh, to us, to all people of all time. Authoritative words, but John writing in the Spirit also adds a further warning, and that's why John diverted and uh, didn't give us the full flow here. He diverts in verse 37, and he adds his own warning for those who are not responding to the word of God. Verse 37, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Why? That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. In other words, he was giving these truths from God. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because, that, that is, they believed intellectually, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They feared men, right? For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So we observe from this passage, those who are men-focused love the praise of men and also fear the criticism of men. But those who are God-focused love to please the Lord. They're not worried about what men think about him. They fear him to do what is right. And commenting further on this passage 37 to 43, I want to say clearly, it is God who opens the eyes, opens the mind to truth, and is Satan who blinds the, the mind and blinds the eyes. Uh, one example of that is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, which says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe. That's a reference to Satan whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe. <clears throat> yes, Satan blinds the mind uh, and God opens the eyes. But when Satan blinds a man's eyes, God has allowed it. And therefore the scripture, and Isaiah in particular in this case, attributes what God allows to God himself. So it says in verse 40, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. 
lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. God allows it because they would not hear. The point is, do not ignore the words of the Lord to you. For he may say, okay, have it your way. And if God gives you over to Satan, the world and the flesh, to allow those influences to work in your life, to blind your heart and mind, there is then no hope for you. Romans 1.28 explains that and many other verses too. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want to know about God, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Don't keep saying no to God. Don't keep ignoring God. Allow him to speak to you and respond to his word. So there are only two groups. If you're not actively for the Lord, you're indeed against him. Your allegiance will not be hidden. So, dear friend, where do you stand? Do you stand for Jesus? I'd say, well, good. That's a good choice to make. But let's be honest about this. If you stand for Jesus, there's going to be war too. Spurgeon said, if you follow Christ, you'll have all the dogs of the world yelping at your heels. The world will not speak well of you. He who has the friendship of the world is an enemy to God. But if you are true and faithful to the Most High, men will resent your unflinching integrity since it is a test me against their sin. Spurgeon also said, fearless of all consequences, you must do the right. You will need the courage of a lion unhesitatingly to pursue a course which may turn your best friend into your fiercest foe. For the love of Jesus, you must be courageous. For the truth's sake, to hazard reputation and love will need a degree of moral principle which only the Spirit of God can work in you. Yet turn not your back like a coward, but play the man. Follow right manfully on foot in, in your master's steps, for he has tra traversed this rough way before you. Better a brief warfare and eternal rest than false peace and everlasting torment. That's the end of the quote. So may I ask, dear friends, front and back, where do you stand? Please stand with Christ and for Christ. Do not back down. And don't forget, although it will be warfare, God's grace is there for you every day. He will, when we're weak, uh, then we are strong in him. His grace is sufficient for us. Where do you stand? It is necessary that Jesus divides men um, into these two groups because there can be no sin in heaven. If God were allowed to one man, allow one man with sin into heaven, then heaven would be spoiled. It wouldn't be perfect anymore. There's got to be a place where there is no sin and heaven is that place and no man can enter heaven uh, with sin in his life. We need the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Some men are so proud and so stubborn, they will not come to Christ. They will not bow the knee. They cannot be his and they cannot be in heaven. Where do you stand? Where do you stand tonight? And where will you stand in the future? Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and how he battled with people that they might know the truth and the truth might set them free, that they might have life and they might have life and they might have, have liberty. Life and light and liberty, these are good things, Lord. Please grant those to us as we respond to you in a most definite way tonight. We love you, Lord Jesus. We stand with you. And yes, it may cost us our lives one day, but please, by your grace, help us to stand, and having done all, to stand. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Carl is going to come and lead in the last hymn. It is a hymn of commitment. Would you make these words your own words?
Dear church, we were uh, commanded this morning to follow after Christ as he calls us to follow him. And then this evening again, we've been pushed even further. You know, we need to commit ourselves to Christ more fully to follow after him in everything we do. So I want to invite you, as Wayne just has, if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to sing this hymn as the first prayer you've ever prayed to God truthfully. If you've made this decision to follow after Christ, sing this as a celebration for what is a fact in your life. Let's stand to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Great God and Heavenly Father, I feel convinced tonight more than ever that there is a commitment required to follow the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ all the way till our death. Thank you so much, Lord, for the death that he died for us. And I pray, Lord, that this would be our meditation this week, that such a horrible death was suffered by the one and only true King on our behalf, so that sinners like us may enter into eternity with you. Oh, I am so thankful, Lord, for the salvation that we have. Thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you've given to your children, namely Jesus Christ and him crucified. Bless our weeks, Lord, and let these words penetrate our minds as we go forth into the week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go in peace, church. Enjoy. Enjoy.